part of my opening statement was uh, either confused or, or mis misunderstood. And when I said that the argument that this was possibly not constitutional, that we should find a way to make it constitutional, or what exactly the verbiage I'm used, I'm not sure, was basically saying what Mr. Newbern said. Uh, Mr. Newbern believes it's totally constitutional and, and totally proper. But you know, after Plessy v. Ferguson, there were a lot of people that said that was the law of the land. And it went on for 58 more years until Thurgood Marshall had the good sense and the courage to bring a, a case to the Supreme Court and say, no, separate was not equal. And Brown v. Board of Education changed all that. And sometimes you can take a position that something's the law and that there's not standing or there's not venue, but the courts can find it. Now, the words manner of election, in Florida, who was allowed to vote determined who was president of the United States. And that affected people in all 49 states. And there should be a, a basis where an election for president of the United States, if you vote in Florida or you can't vote in Florida, but you could vote in Michigan, it's not fair. People should be able to have the same standards by which they vote to elect the President of the United States, in my opinion. And in my opinion, we ought to find arguments and make arguments that hopefully a court will accept. I have little faith in this court that we have right now to accept those arguments or any arguments. But we need to make progress in this country. And this is 2010. You know, there were sightings, and I understand the sightings. You hear them on the floor, and I use them too. Founding Fathers, what, what Alexander Hamilton thought. Alexander Hamilton didn't think women should vote, and he didn't think African Americans should be free. And he didn't think if he didn't own property or couldn't pass some literacy test that you should be able to vote either. And Thomas Jefferson said constitutions should not be seen as sacrosanct, but like children who outgrow their clothing, they should be able to adjust as they grow and fit new clothes and fit new ideas. And the idea that we should be trapped in a mentality that denies people a chance to vote, that because they committed a wrong at one time mean they are perpetually wrong and never have an opportunity is is, is, I think, antithetical to the basis of the founding of this nation and what this nation is supposed to stand for. Now, I know the organization Mr. Clegg represents, Center for Equal Opportunity, it's a confusing name because usually when you see Center for Equal Opportunity, you think of something else. You know, I know in George Orwell, he wrote about the Department of Peace that waged war, the Department of, of Education that burned books. So I guess it's all right because that great literary classic to have something called the Center for Equal Opportunity. But I would submit to you what you're talking about is not equal opportunity. It's saying that one time burned, forever scorched. And as I mentioned, and I think somebody here referenced, the Hester Prine, I think it was Mr. Sancho, you shouldn't have a perpetual scarlet letter. The idea that people can become good citizens. And the fact is, in most elections, not more than 25 percent of those in a good election year take the opportunity to vote and exercise their freedoms and their franchise. So if you take these people who are supposed to be the bottom of the barrel and give them the opportunity, they've got a chance by their proof to show by going to the polls that they're better than 75 percent of the country that neglects their opportunity to vote. But give them a chance. And if they want to vote, obviously they're better citizens than you think. But I would submit to you that this, this legislation is appropriate. I appreciate Mr. Newburn's uh, well-reasoned argument that just like the literacy test in 65, that people came up here and said, oh, that's not the law and you can't do it, just like people said civil rights isn't the law and you can't do it, that America needs to bring its resources together and its best legal talent to formulate arguments, to present to a court that hopefully will accept them and move this country out of where it, was, where it is in certain of these laws, which are vestiges of Jim Crow. Now, Mr. Clegg, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you think that Jim Crow laws still have an effect on society today? that people have been affected by those laws and that they are disenfranchised and or disadvantaged because of the long history of Jim Crow laws in this nation? Yes, I do. You do? Well, where under equal opportunity do they, should they get some extra opportunity because of the fact that they're starting with a, 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 a weight around their ankle? Well, I think that there are uh, the playing field is, is not level uh, in, in, in many different ways. But I think that there are people of all colors at both ends of the playing field. And I think that where you and I may differ is that I don't think that you should use skin color as a proxy for whether somebody is poor or not, or whether somebody is disadvantaged or not. If you want to have programs, and we may be able to agree on some programs that help people who uh, come from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, who are poor, uh, who, who live in poverty, 
But uh, let me ask you this, Mr. There are Clegg. People the of all the, colors. The, Mr. Clegg, uh, the question I asked was about Jim Crow. Jim Crow was targeted at African Americans. Tell me where you agree that Jim Crow laws that targeted African Americans still affect African Americans today, and how can we remedy that? I think that, well, for, you know, to give you an example, uh, I, you could probably, uh, without too much difficulty, show that an individual uh, living in poverty can trace that poverty to the fact that uh, his uh, father uh, was not able to uh, get a good education um, because of Jim Crow laws. You can do that. However, uh, there are, uh, I don't think that you should say, okay, well, therefore, we are going to make a program available to you this other person over here, he's poor, but the reason he's poor is because he just uh, uh, immigrated uh, from Mexico. But the and government the of the United States is poor Mr. Clegg, because he this, just came Mr. over Clegg, on, a, on, a, on a boat from uh, Southeast Asia. Mr. We Clegg, don't care about them. look at me and let me give you something. What the question is with Jim Crow laws, the states of this government, under the permission of the United States government, passed laws to keep those people as second-class citizens. Nobody passed any laws saying that people that came over in boats, like my great-grandfather did, had to be second-class. There were no laws on the books. This government passed laws and said, you can't go to water fountains, you can't go to theaters, you can't have jobs, you can't have contracts. And that happened. So how do you rectify the lingering consequences of Jim Crow? My point is, is that the, uh, the poverty and the so forth, the disadvantages that people suffer because of Jim Crow can be remedied, but there's no reason to drop... How do you do it? Tell me how you do it. Opportunity. Tell me how you do it. Don't tell me how you get these other people. Don't put them on the same boat. How do we help these people that this government, this, more, this, this, well, this life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness that enslaved people and then did it through laws passed by legislatures and congresses, how do you help those people? If you have somebody who is in, uh, who is in poverty, uh, you can have programs that provide um, uh, you know, better educational opportunities, that uh, provide you know, you know, a, a Head Start program or something like that, scholarships, um, uh, special mentoring programs. There's all kinds of, uh, of, of programs. And if I go to your to website, improve, will I see those types? My of, point is If I go to your website, will I find your website showing programs like that that you espouse and advocate? Yes, uh, and you will find it made very clear that we have no objection at all to programs that improve the uh, opportunities for disadvantaged people without regard to race or ethnicity. Ex and that is why, I mean, you, you, know, you were, you were uh, criticizing uh, as misleading the, the name of my organization. Uh, th the reason that we are the Center for Equal Opportunity is to draw a distinction between uh, those who believe in equal opportunity, which we do, and those who believe in racially mandated equal results, which is something that we reject. We do not like quotas. Uh, we believe in e pluribus unum. We don't think that uh, statutes and laws that give preference on the basis of race and ethnicity uh, are, are constitutional or a good policy. And let me just say, uh, Congressman Cohen, you know, my notes show that when you were giving your opening statement, you used the phrase, get around it, referring to the Constitution. Uh, I don't think... You can't get around the Constitution. You've got to make a good argument, and that's what I was submitting. When I say I, get around, I mean get around the mentality that you've got, that it's set in stone, and that you don't have jurisdiction. I'm submitting that Mr. Newbern is right, and that you can make an argument that there is jurisdiction, and there is, in my opinion, and Mr. Newbern made it, and that's what I mean. I meant get around your mentality that says there isn't, and therefore don't try to make progress. I my time has expired, and I thank Mr. Scott for the hearing. Can I, can I, I congratulate the congrat Constitution, and with all respect, I think that that is a very uh, troubling attitude for somebody who has taken an oath to the Constitution to have. Can I congratulate you, uh, uh, Representative Cohn, on putting into my mind an argument that I should have thought of but didn't. Um, but it is another very powerful reason why you have uh, authority to pass it. It's astonishing to me that somebody, um, that a felon uh, or somebody who has been convicted of passing a bad check in Florida can't vote. But somebody who is convicted of passing a bad check in Georgia can vote. Now, that's the kind of irrational discrimination on the ability to vote that should trigger of the 14th Amendment's power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Um, the passage of uniform criteria that would sand down irrational differences state to state on whether you can vote for President of the United States seems to me clearly within this committee's power without 
without the necessity of going to the 15th Amendment. It's a 14th Amendment argument, um, and I didn't think of it until you were until you were making your point. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank Mr. Newburn. I also want to let the, the Mr. Clegg know that Congress people get the last word. And after I closed and you questioned my taking oath of office, which I take seriously, let me submit to you that Dr. King said so appropriately that sometimes when the laws are wrong, it's all right to resist them because they're inherently wrong and morally wrong. And what I'm submitting is arguments can be made not to subvert the Constitution, but to change the Constitution, to change the law of this land, because you change it through arguments and words have meaning and you put flesh on them. Thank you very much. Uh,